Hello people, and in today's video we're going to go through a list of 20 arguments for veganism. 15 of these are in no particular order and are of varying merit, but at the end I go through 5 more arguments which I think are just outright bad. For each of the 20 arguments I've made my own formalization in propositional logic. If you don't care about this, then it's okay, just ignore it, I'll explain what the arguments are doing anyway. But for anyone who is more interested in the argument, I think maybe that will be useful to have the formalization on the screen. And you might want to pause the video to read the formalizations if you are interested. All of them ultimately conclude with therefore I should be vegan. But for anyone who's interested in that kind of thing, let me know down below if you agree with my formalizations. So let's get into it. Number one, Immanuel Kant's indirect principle. So by harming animals, I harm myself. Immanuel Kant is considered by almost everyone who is philosophically literate to be, if not the greatest philosopher of all time, very, very near the top of the list. So although Kant wasn't vegan, he did actually conclude some things which went in the direction of animal rights at the time, such as, for example, he condemned people who shot a horse when it became too old to be of use. He said that we should have gratitude for the long service of animals, such as horses, just as though they were members of our own household, and that tormenting animals or treating them without love is morally wrong, but not because the animals themselves, but because it is demeaning to ourselves to treat animals without love, and that's what makes it wrong. In my opinion, Kant's indirect principle is one of the more powerful arguments for veganism when debating difficult philosophically literate opponents, especially on Discord for example, but it certainly isn't easy to cogently argue for, not only because it is itself complex, but because the target audience for this line of reasoning is going to be limited to very intelligent, philosophically literate people. You can argue a watered down version on the street, but there's not really much point because the word on the street is kiss. Keep it simple, silly. Number two, the golden and silver rules. So in line with keeping it simple, treat others how you'd want to be treated yourself and don't treat others how you wouldn't want to be treated yourself. So this is pretty clear and it's pretty simple. Definitely is compatible with the KISS principle for street debates and for keeping it simple, silly. So let's say, for example, you pointed to some footage of pigs in a gas chamber and you just asked, would you like to be in that gas chamber yourself? Would you like to be locked in this cage like this? If you were that animal, would you like to have your towel and teeth cut out without anaesthetic? Most people are going to say no. So if you hold the golden rule to be true or the silver rule that you should do to others as you like to have done to yourself and you find that compelling, then that's a pretty good argument. The problem comes though when people say, well, humans aren't animals. We treat animals differently because animals are animals and humans are humans. So in that case, we can't continue this line of reasoning because we need a support argument from another type of argument. We need to first establish that there isn't any reason preventing us from granting moral status to non-human animals. Three, marginal cases. So this is where marginal cases comes in. We can establish with marginal cases that there isn't any reason preventing us from granting moral consideration to non-human animals. This argument was used back in the 18th century by the father of utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham, when he was himself making a case for animal moral consideration. But it can be traced back even further than Bentham. The modern form of marginal cases looks something like this. All we're doing here is pointing out that there aren't any morally relevant differences in abilities between marginal case humans and most of the non-human animals we eat. A marginal case human is a human which has a diminished mental capacity or diminished ability in some way like a disabled person, mentally disabled person, but a person which we still would treat with moral respect and wouldn't eat, of course but is nonetheless diminished in capacity in some way. So we just say, look at these people over here who are disabled. We still extend them moral consideration, despite the fact they don't have any special abilities or any additional abilities that non-human animals don't have. So if we're extending them moral consideration and there's no morally relevant difference, then we should extend animals' moral consideration as well. One of the most popular modern-day proponents of the marginal case type argument is Peter Singer. But talking about Peter Singer and Jeremy Bentham, it's time to discuss, number four, utilitarianism. First, we need to define what utility is. So let's go by using Jeremy Bentham's original definition. 
By the principle of utility is meant that principle which approves or disapproves of every action whatsoever according to the tendency which it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question, or, what is the same thing in other words, to promote or to oppose that happiness. I say of every action whatsoever, and therefore not only of every action of a private individual, but of every measure of government. As non-human animals can also be judged in terms of augmenting or diminishing their happiness, any calculation of utility should include them unless there is some valid reason not to. There are a large amount of differing utilitarian positions, but generally, any such position will by definition be forced to consider the utility of non-human animals unless we reject that they fit into our sphere of moral consideration. That's why famous utilitarians such as Peter Singer often fall back on marginal cases to demonstrate how there is actually no reason why we should kick out non-human animals of our sphere of moral consideration. But one of my main problems with utilitarian positions is that they do not seem to reflect a coherent, consistent sense of what we mean by moral conduct. For example, if it were to augment happiness more than it diminished it to eat a beef burger or kill an animal, by definition, that would be seen as the moral good thing to do. But this doesn't seem to reflect what we're trying to achieve when we're using it to ground veganism. So what do we do about that then? Well, let's go back to Kant. Number five, in our first argument, we looked at Kant's indirect principle, but that's not the only way we can use Kant's philosophy to get to veganism. We can also use it to argue that animals are ends in themselves, and there are various philosophers who put forth a neo-Kantian perspective that animals should have direct moral consideration, not just indirect. One of the most influential advocates today being Christine Korsgaard. But again, this just really isn't the sort of thing you're going to be arguing on the street with some sort of like drunken passerby. It's just too complex to unpack. But that doesn't mean that the argument isn't highly valuable for intellectual debate on the internet, on YouTube, on Discord, and platforms where philosophy is actually being discussed in an ambitious way and not just some sort of like street interaction where you've only got 30 seconds to try and get your point across. There are other modern day philosophers who were influenced heavily by Kant but arrived at a slightly different kind of approach. Number six a rights-based approach. So Tom Reagan is probably the strongest name associated with animal rights within the academic philosophical literature. And by rights, I don't just mean like speaking up for animals or being an animal advocate or something. I mean actually animal rights, the rights-based approach. Almost nobody is going to take the position that when we talk about rights, we're addressing an ontological entity within someone that is hidden out of view and when zapped with a ray gun would result in the animal or human weighing slightly less. That's not really what anyone means when we say that people have rights or animals have rights or they're rights bearers. What is meant rather is that we're establishing a moral groundwork And instead of saying it's morally wrong to do such and such action, we're saying that there are rights bearers and you can violate the rights of rights bearers in various different ways. And violating those rights is what is morally wrong. So rather than saying, for example, murdering someone is wrong, we'd say that humans have the right to life and violating that right is morally wrong. And I see three different main ways how people ground this. The first one is using some sort of neo-Kantian meta-ethical groundwork, representing the implications of moral duty and the concept of means and ends, but using rights-based language, like Tom Reagan does in the case for animal rights. This seems to be the most established of the animal rights-based approaches, but there are two others I can think of. So, number seven, property rights. So we establish private property rights, again using Kant's universalizability principle, and after we have established property rights, we argue that the owner of property cannot himself be owned by someone else, and then we understand that non-human animals have the right to not be treated as property, and so all subsequent rights are deduced by way of this one ultimate right. The most famous proponent of this today is Gary Francione. This approach is also very much in line with libertarian capitalist political theory. So contrary to popular belief, capitalism as an ideology not only does not necessarily perpetuate the animal holocaust, but it can even be used to ground veganism using its core principles in addition to the fact that it would object in principle to subsidies of animal agriculture. But that's just a side note. And the third and final way that I can see to establish a rights-based approach is number eight, 
starting at human rights and then using marginal cases to deny any reason not to extend the same kind of rights to non-human animals. This is less philosophically robust and a bit more of a layman approach, but people like Vegan Gaines have argued this quite effectively in a nice way in live debates on the internet. Number nine, veil of ignorance type arguments. Essentially, we imagine that we don't know who we will be in society, whether we'll be a man, a woman, white, black, a human, a non-human animal, or whatever being in society. We should design a society, therefore, given the lack of knowledge of who we'll be and the chance that we could be anyone in society. So theoretically, we'd want the society to be fair, because if there's a chance of being anything in society, if it was fair for everyone, then there'd be no problem. But if we design society unequally, for example, we have factory farms, there's a chance you could be that pig on the factory farm, and that's not something you'd want to risk. So you'd like to abolish that and be fair. So logically, this argument sort of gets us to veganism, right? Well, there are a few problems with it. Consider that you're the type of person willing to gamble on being born a white male or human, for example, and you saw it being advantageous to the well-being of white male humans to keep slaves and to eat meat. Well, then this perspective, in some sort of unintentional misfortune of the argument, justifies that as the moral good if you're willing to gamble that you're going to be born a white male human. So the argument doesn't seem to be ironclad for people who figure out its flaw. But the original intention of what it was getting at seems to be quite nice. In the modern day, this argument is often attributed to John Rawls, but actually these types of arguments are much, much older and go back to antiquity. Number 10. Theistic arguments. Take, for example, would God want you to holocaust his animals who he gave the ability to feel pain to? Of course, these arguments are going to be limited in scope because the person has to be both religious and also not so dogmatic to insist that eating animals is okay despite this because God permits it somewhere in their scripture. But sometimes it can get religious people thinking, if God was all loving, would he create a slaughterhouse? Would he be happy with a slaughterhouse existing, with factory farms existing? Would God see that as a good thing? Would God approve of turning his beautiful creations into pink slime? 11. Arguments from Evolutionary Common Ancestor I don't know of any other channels who have made biological evolutionary arguments with any significant airtime on their channels apart from my own, as I've got two videos laying out the argument in detail on my channel, and I've mentioned it in passing in various other videos as well. But it just doesn't really seem to be a very popular argument in the online vegan community. In fact, the only other times I've seen this argued are from people like Richard Dawkins, who is aware of veganism and actually says that he strives towards veganism, but is hardly a vegan activist. So if Richard Dawkins can do this argument, then I guess we can have it in our community as well. It's a pretty cool one, I think. Okay, so it goes something like this. This is my own version. This isn't exactly what Richard Dawkins would say, but what I would say would go something a bit like this. We share common ancestors with animals that we enslave and abuse in animal agriculture, and so farm animals are technically very distant cousins. So unless you would kill your cousin, or your second cousin, or your third cousin, or so on, there must be a cut-off point at which you start killing and eating your nth cousin. So what number cousin do you start eating? When we put it like this, it tends to get people thinking a bit about the relationship we have with other animals. And then the second half of my argument, once we've gone through the sort of cousin thing, we then pick an animal which they wouldn't kill, such as an elephant, and then we show them how we're more closely related to cows and pigs than we are elephants. Cows and pigs are our 21st millionth cousins, whereas elephants are our 31st millionth cousins. As I say, I like this argument. It's an interesting argument, but it obviously is going to fall flat on its face if you're talking to a young earth creationist or it's someone who can't conceptualise the evolution of life on the planet. But when you're talking to someone who can conceptualise it, it's actually a good entry point to fall back onto a marginal case type argument because they will say, well, look, we're not that closely related to pigs, for example, because we're so far apart that pigs aren't intelligent like humans are. And then you just go straight into marginal cases and say, okay, well, pigs aren't intelligent and your criteria for judging moral value is intelligence. Well, then should we kill unintelligent people? And yeah, it goes like that. So it's actually quite a useful argument and I think it should get some more love. Number 12. 
Name the trait pre-2019 reinterpretation of the trait equalization process. So, name the trait is a modern-day variant on marginal cases presented in a dialogue tree form for use predominantly in online debates, but it can also be used in a similar way on the street. This was originally a very persuasive argument for use on philosophical lay people online, as they imagined their mother, for example, or some, someone they cared about turning into a chicken and then thinking how they wouldn't kill this chicken then, because it, it used to be their mother. So they either entered into a contradiction between saying that chickens do and don't have moral value, or they just bit the bullet on saying something silly like they would be okay with killing and eating any human who happened to be unintelligent, or whatever trait they named as the morally relevant difference in traits between humans and non-human animals. And this worked really nicely in live debates with philosophically illiterate lay people for quite a while, until upon closer, more critical inspection, it was seen to be a bit of an unsound argument as it contained problems of logical identity, especially for people with certain metaphysical or meta-ethical positions educated in philosophy it didn't stand up particularly well to scrutiny. Number 13. Name the trait post-2019 reinterpretation of the trait equalisation process. So, after the unsoundness of the original name the trait argument was discussed at length by various people in the community, it was retroactively reinterpreted by its author to have a new meaning. The words trait equalisable to a given non-human animal became proprietary language or put otherwise, code speak for something better described by <gasps> able hypothetically to be placed in the first of a series of possible worlds in which each subsequent possible world contains different beings diverging in properties from the first in a way which becomes ever closer to the nature of the last world in which there exists the exact same non-human animal which you've just already affirmed has no more value. Now that's a bit of a mouthful, but that is basically what the new reinterpretation means now. And doing this actually did resolve the previous issues concerning laws of identity and objecthood, and so name the trait became a sound argument with this new reinterpretation. And people who were originally critical of the original interpretation, such as myself, perspective philosophy, shadow starshine, all agree now that the argument's sound. But the question is, at what cost to the argument? Because this new proprietary definition of the words trait equalizable to a given non-human animal has had a strange effect when retroactively applied to the syllogism, which we can see very clearly when we simply swap the proprietary words out with the non-proprietary words. So now you can clearly see that by saying exact same non-human animal which you have already confirmed has no moral value whilst retaining moral value, we're saying something which has moral value which has no moral value that renders the syllogism redundant as all it's saying now is if you contradict yourself then you'll be contradicting yourself. Well, duh. So it's obvious that post-reinterpretation of the trait equalization process where a new proprietary definition was given, the core argument doesn't seem to make any sense anymore and now it's just some kind of bizarre pointless word salad which doesn't really say anything apart from something trivial. If you contradict yourself, that's a contradiction. Therefore, 14. The police lineup. So in order to still man the name the trait argument and at the same time simplify it so it could be communicated easier and used in a more layman conversation, just like it was before when it was a simple metamorphosis before this weird reinterpretation, I created a fresh take on the thought experiment of name the trait, which I called the police lineup. And for this, you're just asked to imagine a police lineup where on the left you have a human being and on the right you have a chicken. And the beings in between the two are various mutants which go from being somewhat human-like to more chicken-like until you finally reach the actual chicken on the right-hand side. You simply pick out of the police lineup the beings that you'd eat and you describe the beings. For example, you might eat the chicken with human legs, but you wouldn't eat the human with chicken legs. This is because the human with chicken legs is more intelligent than the chicken with human legs, and so on. And based upon what the person's describing being the difference they see among the participants in the police lineup, which cause them to have moral feelings in regards to one but not the other, then that just forms the basis of your normal objections that we would have for any marginal case type argument. So if they say intelligence, we'll just say, would you be happy with eating unintelligent humans or killing unintelligent humans and so on. 
But ultimately, the police lineup was just intended as an easier visualization of what was being asked by the name the trait argument, doing away with proprietary language and all of the weird word salads which routinely just confused people. Sort of like a new, prettier front end for the same computer program. But name the trait still had some unaddressed issues. Like, what happens if you wanted to run the argument on someone who was more of a particularist, or someone who objected to the idea of traits intrinsic to the non-human animal, like rationality rules did? when they had a conversation, or a whole host of other people where name the trait didn't really seem to work properly. So that's why I felt like it was necessary to come up with something else. So number 15, atomistic marginal cases. So I created a new type of marginal case argument to get around some of these weird problems. The idea was to frame the question of what constitutes morally relevant differences between human and non-human animals within the context of a Wittgensteinian logical atomism. Although I do think that the argument accomplished what I set out to do, almost nobody who watched the video, aside from a few of my Discord philosophy buddies, actually understood what logical atomism was, or what the problem I was trying to solve was, or how my solution actually solved it. So despite the fact that I quite like the argument, I still do like the argument, I think it solves a bunch of problems, no one understood it. And if no one can understand the argument, then it's not a very good argument if you can't use it. So I think this one's a bit more restricted in its scope to pretty much being discussed in a serious philosophical debate with people who are very knowledgeable about philosophy. Using this in any other context, especially street activism, obviously just doesn't make any sense. So now that concludes the list of arguments of varying degrees of merit from the great to the complex to the unsound to the downright weird. So now is time to look at some outright bad arguments. Number 16. Arguments from environment. You can argue for a plant-based diet, but it's hard to argue for veganism from a starting point of the environment. That is, unless you're going to argue that harming the environment harms other animals. But in which case, all you're doing is kicking the can down the road on the question of why we should not exploit animals or harm animals in the first place. Number 17. Argument from health benefits and weight loss. A variation on this would be to say that animal products are unclean or yucky in some way. But the argument from health benefits gets you very efficiently to a plant-based diet, but it doesn't get you to a vegan position as you can eat a plant-based diet without being vegan. These kinds of arguments have caused many yo-yo dieting airheads to ostensibly join the vegan movement, only later to then take a huge shit on the floor and leave doing more harm than good to the movement. Generally, these are the type of fools who are going to be making why I'm not vegan anymore type videos. 18. Argument from promised benefits. So there was this whole thinking of go vegan because you'll get a hot vegan partner and make lots of money on YouTube. It's obvious how these type of arguments don't get us to a legitimate vegan position, despite it being another one of the core arguments which persuaded many of the airheads to join the movement. Number 19. Argument from world hunger. Again, this gets you to a plant-based diet, but unless you're arguing some niche indirect point which affects non-human animals in some less obvious way, like for example wild animal suffering being reduced by increasing human populations, in which case this would be quite a clever argument, but I'm not sure if it would really be a particularly cogent one for most people. And again, it's still kicking the can down the road on why ought we value non-human animals anyway. Number 20. Argument from necessity. This argument takes the form, go vegan because it's not necessary for our health to eat animals. And this might seem as one of the strongest arguments for veganism, so you might object to it being at the bottom of my list here. But actually, it can be one of the weakest arguments if not used as part of some broader line of reasoning. For example, some Kantian argument plus saying, by the way, it's not necessary to eat animals to be healthy, so there's no practical impediment to you adopting the ethical position you disagreed with. But if you're just going to try and argue in isolation, go vegan because eating meat is unnecessary, it's extremely weak. Because there are many things that you might do in life which are completely unnecessary, but you do them anyway. Listening to music is completely unnecessary for your survival as a human being. But most people do it anyway. Most people really love listening to music. So if music's unnecessary, but vegans listen to music anyway, then eating animals might not be necessary, but people can just eat animals anyway. The point that eating animal products is unnecessary is only relevant in the context where someone says, okay, well, I agree with everything that you've just argued in terms of the morality, the ethical issues. Like, I agree with all of that, but don't we need to eat meat to survive? Then you say, oh, no, it's completely unnecessary to eat meat to be healthy because this, this and that. 
but you wouldn't just argue <laughs> just starting off. Go vegan because eating meat is unnecessary. So, I hope you enjoyed that. 20 arguments for veganism, with five being particularly bad arguments, which you shouldn't use in isolation. Let me know your favourite arguments in the comments section down below. And if you know any arguments which I didn't include on this list, then definitely share those down below as well. So don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next video.